This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and we continue in our Bible study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. But before we do that, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we're controlled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and opportunity to study your word. And as your word goes out, Lord, we ask that many will hear, that many will believe and begin to apply the word of God in their lives. So we ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by going back. And looking at a translation again in verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us out of the coming wrath. Now we saw last time that part of the believer's expectation is to wait for the Son of God to deliver them from a coming wrath. We're going to discuss that extensively in a few minutes but I want to point out to you that this teaching of the expecting of expecting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is every is in every chapter of this epistle so it is a it is a major theme through not only first Thessalonians but through second Thessalonians and what I would suggest for you to do if you want to really get this book down, I, I usually say get it wired so you can, as I've told others, you want to own what this says, you want to know exactly what it says. And to me, this is a critical book to understand, especially in our day and time. We were surrounded by many who will teach other things regarding this subject, but it's important that you learn this on your own. And one of the first suggestions I would make, this even goes back to seminary days, is to read through the entire book in one setting. It's a short book. In fact, I'd suggest to read both First and Second Thessalonians through in one setting. Uh, pick out a good translation and read through it once, and then maybe later read through it again another translation. If you read through it more than once, let me suggest that in your second reading that you play this little, uh, I'll just call it a role-playing game, where you picture yourself back there as one of the Thessalonians and you receive this letter from Paul. Or you're hearing it for the first time read to you as you sit there among other believers. And I've given you the background of this where they're going through persecutions. A lot of them are new believers. Uh, maybe there's just some new teachers in their uh, church assembly. But outside there's hostility. And you don't have a strong teacher available like you had when Paul was there. So you get a little bit angle, different angle on your reading and probably a better understanding. You'll get the gist of what's being taught. You'll pick up on some of the major themes. And you'll have, it's kind of like looking at the, uh, instead of looking at the trees, you're looking at the forest. You're looking at the location of the forest. So you know where you're at. Now, what I like to do sometime, I will make notes of the passages regarding a particular theme. In this case, I did this for you last time, I went through and picked up the passages that talked about the coming of Christ. Um, let me see if I can get those 
on the board for you again. I did some adjustments to this. This is for getting the gist of what the themes, uh, where we're getting, what we're having said about the theme. I can only get part of it up here at once. Okay. Uh, it talks about reward. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For who is our hope, our joy, or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? So one of the things we see that characterizes the coming is reward. Try to remember these things or take note of them. Now what I like to do is just, is just write them down. Write down, here's the coming. Here's what involves the coming. The second thing we see is evaluation. Very similar to reward. Obviously, there's evaluation, then reward. But these passages say it a little bit differently. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness in the presence of our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his holy ones. 523, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your entire spirit and inner self and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have three passages that clearly teach at this coming of Jesus Christ that this referring to, there is evaluation and there is reward. Also, 1 Thessalonians 4.15 For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, what, uh, that we who are alive, being left behind, survivors, that's basically what that means, until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And that's a passage on resurrection. Now, one other point to be made. If you read the books, as I said, and read these passages in context, you will find perhaps something that you've never seen before. But let me just read this with you. One of the things about the coming is that it's unexpected. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, we will get into great detail on these passages later. But first, I just want you to get familiar with the ground here. If you're familiar with the teachings of Jesus and the second coming, he teaches by parables. I reminded you last time of the ten maidens were there to be ready when he returns. There are direct commands to be ready, Matthew 24, 44, Luke 12, 40. And if you're with me in James, you saw it that uh, the coming of Jesus was considered near. Now, that may be hard for us to really get set in our minds. If you think about it, people have been viewing Jesus' coming as near and are to have uh, supposed to have been ready for over 2,000 years yet. And that's one of the challenging things about our faith. Do we keep on believing what the Word tells us to believe? And just as much now as it was back then, we should be eagerly anticipating our Lord's return. I don't know if I've ever met a Christian in my years, especially as those Christians get older, who don't talk more and more about the Lord's return as they get older and older. And that only makes good sense. Not everybody sees death as something we want to go through, the pain, but we'd all like to see the Lord come back and take us all to be with him. Paul writes in his epistles, it's not unusual for him to write about 
believers eagerly anticipating the Lord's return. Romans 8, 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's Romans 8, 23. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Philippians 3.20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.5, 5, But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. Here's the point. This report on the Thessalonians with the first generation of believers. Now what I'm saying is not only the Thessalonians, but this first generation of believers. We just saw uh, these other written, these letters written to them, Romans and 1 Corinthians and Philippians and Galatians. All of the believers of that first generation, including the apostles, this tells us that they all anticipated the soon return of Christ. You want to know what the mindset of a Christian is? He eagerly anticipates Jesus coming back. Now this is a theme that Paul repeated many times to many Christians. Now let's go back to verse 10 and begin to look at this one carefully. Let me read it one more time. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us out of the coming wrath. We see the phrase in reference to Jesus, whom he raised from the dead. All right? That is... God raised the Son from the dead, Jesus. Now here he is writing about Jesus' return, and he mentions the fact that he was raised from the dead. And I would think resurrection was a much appreciated topic for those who are being threatened and persecuted. Paul makes the point that this Jesus who is coming was raised from the dead. He's already preceded you. And then we know in chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians, resurrection for the believer is a major topic. And it's the same Jesus, the one who has been resurrected, that you're waiting for, that is coming to rescue you out of the coming wrath. The phrase, who rescues us, is the present mental participle. The middle voice tells us that the subject participates in the action and may have a vested interest in that action. He, turn, he comes to rescue. Translated, who rescues us, the word is ruomai, R-U-O-M-A-I. It means to rescue or deliver. Just as we use the term today, it means to rescue out of danger, from persecution, or something you do not want to experience. And this present middle participle tells us that this is an ongoing rescue that he himself is involved in. So it's something that is going on. Now these are some concepts that's hard for us to grasp in our Western world. But let's begin to try to think in terms of the way they understood this. Uh, we could put it this way. Jesus is the rescuer. He's the deliverer. He is the one who is going to rescue us from what's coming. And that's described as the coming wrath. The word for coming, present middle participle, uh, erkomai, it means to come, frequently used in scripture. And then a word for wrath. The word here in the Greek is orge. Think of org. An orge. Wrath or anger. Now in front of this word in the Greek we have the article. So this is the wrath. 
and then with that participle, it is the coming wrath, a particular wrath that he's talking about. And the challenge will be, which wrath is Paul writing about? First of all, we see that it is a coming wrath. But there are many wraths in the scripture. And there are more than one coming wraths. So at this point, if you're getting used to this ministry, you know what's coming. The doctrine of the wrath of God. The doctrine of the wrath of God. Let me get this set up. I will be using the NIV unless otherwise noted. Okay, here we go. The doctrine of the wrath of God. Introduction. One introduction. We often think of wrath or anger as being destructive and sinful. This is often true of human wrath. However, God's wrath is linked to his righteous indignation where there is some violation that offends his holiness and righteousness and that it may be judged. Why would I put in that word may? Wouldn't God have to judge it? Well, that depends. If God has forgiven and Jesus has paid the price for that judgment, that clearly leaves open the door for God to show mercy and forgiveness. So that's why I inserted the word may. God may choose to turn away his wrath. Now, the expression of God's wrath may take many forms toward individuals with sickness and death or towards nations with famine and sword and so on. In the Old Testament, the nature of this wrath relates to life and punishment on earth. Now I say this because this is important to understand that those in the Old Testament days, not only just uh, uh, believers, but even pagans, they didn't think so much of the afterlife in heaven as they followed along with their mythologies and what they believed that way. But even believers didn't always think in terms of eternal wrath. But they were thinking in terms of life as it's related to earth. Even when they died, they thought of going down into the earth or under the earth. So it wasn't related to going to the heavens. However, when we come to the New Testament, the nature of the wrath includes not only the Old Testament perspective, but then we start to get the eternal element to it. And the perspective of death is such that when one dies, he's actually just not living. Because life is associated with God. Okay, that gives you an idea of what wrath is in the Old Testament. Now let's see some of the actions of wrath and why it occurs. Point two. It occurs towards gross and sinful activity of a people. We're familiar with Sodom and Gomorrah, Deuteronomy 29, 23, and the actual occasion is Genesis 19, 24 through 29. B, other places are called or likened to Sodom and Gomorrah when they show some similar sinful and evil traits. Isaiah 1, 9, 3, 9, 13, 9, Jeremiah 23, 24, and 50, 40. Deuteronomy 29, 23 reads, The whole land will be a burning waste of salt 
and sulfur. Nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It would be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Admah, and Zeboyim, which the Lord overthrew in fierce anger. So we see, generally speaking, that there is wrath from God towards some of the gross and sinful activity of a people. 3. Towards Israel when they violate the Mosaic Covenant. If you read any scripture on these, make sure you read Leviticus 26, the entire chapter where it explains the disciplines, the levels of discipline, one comes after another, as the people of Israel were disobedient. I'm going to read to you part of that, Leviticus 6.15. Leviticus 26.15. This is part of the covenant, the penalty and blessing part. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws, and fail to carry out my commands, and so violate my covenant. Then I will do this for you. I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases, and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. So it goes on and on to describe how bad things are going to get if they don't repent, and they got to go through another wave of this discipline. This goes pretty much to the end of that chapter. Another reason that the people of Israel were receiving or did receive the wrath of God is because of unbelief. Deuteronomy 9.7 and 8, verse 22, Psalm 106, 32. Uh, New Testament reference recalls back to the people of Israel. We'll read that one. Hebrews 4.3, Now we who have believed entered that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on my oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. Now they did not enter the rest, the, the rest because of unbelief. Those who did believe entered the rest. Roman numeral 4, what we would expect toward individuals for their sin. Men in general, Psalm 76, uh, verse 10, 90, verse 7. Psalm 76, 10 reads, Surely your wrath against men brings you praise. And the survivors of your wrath are restrained. We have wrath towards David, point B, David, Psalm 6, 1. Psalm 38, 1. 6, 1 reads, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. And you'll see the terms anger and discipline often used together. Or uh, you'll see anger instead of wrath. C, Job's friends, Job 42, 7. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So this is the Lord speaking. He's not happy with Job's friends. A warning to those of us who like to give people advice. God is listening. Point five. Wrath toward other nations as Israel's enemies or as nations in general. Psalm 21, 9. And here's a list of them. Uh, a, Egypt. B, Edom. Egypt's Jeremiah 42, 18. Edom, Ezekiel 25, 14. C, Nineveh, representing Assyria. Nahum 1, 6. Towards different kings. Psalm 110.5, and there's a list of many nations in Ezekiel 25 where God executes his wrath. Point six is probably one of the most important points in our study because it relates to what we'll be studying 
in 1 Thessalonians, probably more than any other of these points. But point number six speaks of the day of the Lord, and it's associated with the second advent. This is one of the major expressions of God's judgment and wrath. This is true in both the Old Testament and New Testament. So what I'm saying is, is that the wrath of God is poured out on the day of the Lord. Often, that day of the Lord and the wrath are associated with the second advent. But we've already seen that the wrath isn't always associated with the second advent, or the day of the Lord for that matter. Though the day of the Lord, and that's another doctrine, does often speak of the wrath. That's one of the major characteristics of the day of the Lord, is the wrath. Many passages on this. Isaiah chapter 2, chapters 24 through 27, chapter 34. Isaiah 63, 3 through 6. We'll look at that one. Ezekiel 38 through 39. That's the Gog and Magog. Zephaniah 1, 15 through 18. Uh, 2, 2. Joel 1, 15 and 2, 2. Amos 5, 18, 8, 9. Revelation 6, 7, uh, 16 through 17. Revelation 11, 18. 16, 15 through 19. 28 through 9. If you've got one of those good Bible programs on your computer or on your tablet, whatever you're looking at, if you're able to just go through them like a concordance, uh, type up the word wrath and watch these verses jump out at you. Let's look at Zephaniah 1.15 first of all. That day will be a day of wrath. A day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Now, as we begin to draw from the Old Testament into interpreting our passages, we're going to see that basic things are taught throughout the Old Testament when it comes to things like wrath, the day of the Lord, and they will be uh, mentioned again in the New Testament. Basically what happens is, let me just chart this for a second. What happens is, of course I'm going to have to move my doctrine. That you have your Old Testament, which is of course two-thirds of your Bible, in about 4,000 years. And you have your New Testament, where about, you have a third of your Bible and another 2,000 years, but you'll have these themes that will run through Scripture. Wrath, uh, the day of the Lord, uh, the coming of the Lord picks up. You'll see some of that, the coming of the Messiah. It's not clear in many ways because it's often linked to other concepts of the Messiah like the suffering servant. But then as you get into the New Testament, and Jesus speaks and he's about to uh, before he's arrested, like at the Olivet Discourse, before he has to uh, depart from the disciples, he will speak quite a bit about his own coming when they ask him. And then as we get to the epistles, we see a number of things about his coming. And then, of course, Revelation describes it in great detail. So what I'm saying is these things, uh, you could throw in just the principle of judgment. You'll see them often throughout Scripture. But sometimes they take on a more specialized meaning. Or they may, what we would call, consummate in meaning. In meaning. So that basically, uh, like you talk about the wrath of God, well, the wrath of God uh, actually culminates at the final judgment. That is when it's over with. So you have it throughout the scripture and then towards the final end and at the end you have it culminating in the final judgment where people get the final wrath. Okay? Now, let's continue to look at another 
a couple of major passages regarding the day of the Lord and the second advent. Let me give you the setting. This is quite a quite an interesting and I'd say fascinating few passages. Here's the setting. There's the watchman on the city gate, perhaps in a tower, perhaps on the wall. And his job, of course, is to look out from the city and see if there's anybody approaching, perhaps danger, perhaps an army. And he sees someone coming on a horse, and there's blood on his clothes. And as this horseman comes closer, he begins to ask him a question. Isaiah 63, 1. Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garment stained crimson? Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. So we have this very dramatic picture of a horseman approaching the gates, he dresses like a king, and yet he has blood all over his clothes. The watchman asks him a couple of questions, like, who are you coming from Edom and Basra? Who is this dressed out so much in splendor? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the wine press? It's like he's been out there in the wine press and getting splattered by all the grape juice. I have trodden the wine press alone from the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in anger. I trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments, and I stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of redemption has come. Now as you read this with me, you probably have some bells go off. This sounds like it could be the Lord's return. The horseman continues to speak. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm worked salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. So we have a description of a majestic figure riding a horse, blood on his garments, saying he had a day of vengeance, and that the deer, the day, uh, excuse me, the year of redemption has just started. Now let's turn to Revelation 14, where we see a description of one called the Son of Man, beginning to harvest and to judge the earth. Revelation 14, 14. And I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a Son of Man, with the crown of gold on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had charge of the fire, 
came out from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grape and grapes, and threw them in the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. So what we get a picture of here in Revelation 14 that we got a brief picture of back in Isaiah is basically a judgment and a bloody slaughter. Both portrayed as if someone had been in a wine press and that the blood was all over one's clothes. Now we'll see this more than actually in the next section. Revelation 19.11 the actual description of the second advent. Revelation 19.11 I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we saw in Isaiah the wine press, the slaughter. We see the judgment in Revelation 14 with, again, the mention of grapes and the wine press of God's wrath. And now we see in verse 19 both concepts of the bloody robe dipped in blood and the judgment. That's the wrath of Jesus Christ at the second advent. The next type of wrath we're going to look at is the present wrath. Now we're just going to draw this from the New Testament only because that is where we get the verses for that where it discusses two types of wrath that is going on at the time these epistles were written. I broke them down into two different types. They both they indicate that there's something else going on at the same time and I separate them for that purpose. Now let me just say this, as you go through these wraths, if you go through them again, hope you do, one of the problems of trying to categorize something like this is there's such an overlap and you could actually put those verses under other categories. But my purpose is for you to see there are different types of wrath uh, and different, uh, not only different types of wrath, but towards different types of people or groups of people uh, and that there are coming wraths and there are present wraths. So when we come down to trying to sort out what we saw back in our verse in 1 Thessalonians, we want to try to identify which wrath we're talking about. Now, the present wrath comes in two parts. A, accumulative wrath. Romans 2.5 But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, 
you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Now this is an important concept. It kind of relates back to what I was doing on my chart a while ago. If you take that as an individual, individuals in sin are sometimes pictured as accumulating wrath. So they are piling it up on themselves. Okay, let's do it this, this way. So this is wrath, 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 until bang, down comes the judgment. All right? And it's called his righteous judgment, the day of God's wrath. Now we're not going to try to identify exactly what this point is right here, but we will discuss it. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 what does that say about accumulative wrath? Let me just leave that board up there. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 In their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so they that they might be saved, in this way they always heap up their sins to their limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. And this pictures, as we will see in 1 Thessalonians, people who oppose believers. They actually opposed Paul and them from speaking to the Gentiles. That would be the Jews. And what happens is their opposition was like building up their own penalty or wrath. Then it speaks, the wrath of God has come upon them. But last, that may come very much in time, or perhaps some of them have died. Remember I said the concept of wrath carries over from the Old Testament also. There's actually judgment of wrath on people and groups and nations on earth in time. Okay. So, that's one of the issues. When does this wrath occur? Does it come in this life? Does it come in eternity or both? And then, of course, there's the last judgment. You see? We'll talk about that, too, in a moment. When we get to that wrath. Let's talk about the present wrath. I'll get it back over there for you. John 3.36, very famous verse that we're all familiar with. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects his Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. You know, you kind of picture it as a huge heavy weight hanging over them. It's there. It's there. It just hasn't dropped yet. Romans 1.18, very important one on wrath. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the, un, all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So here we see in real time where God's wrath comes down on people who are still alive. Romans 12, 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. That is a very handy verse. I have found it uh, very valuable in my lifetime when I felt that I was treated wrongly or someone I knew was treated wrongly, and you really don't want to do anything about it. You want to leave it in God's hands. It's his job to deal with those people, and he will. It may not be in this lifetime, but it could be. And you may witness it, and you may not. You may hear about it years down, what happened to them. And in your heart you think, boy, I wonder if that was because of what they did. They may not know for sure. But sometimes you might get some certainty about it. 
there is a future wrath, this is Roman numeral 8, on unbelievers. John the Baptist warned of a coming wrath. But when he saw, Matthew 3, 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And you might say, well, boy, John, that wasn't very nice calling a brood of vipers. you just being honest with them. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Well, here we get one of our first phrases that actually use the terms coming wrath. The parallels in Luke 3, 7. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. What we're looking at, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us out of the coming wrath. Other verses there, Romans 5, 9, Colossians 3, 6, Romans 2, 8, Ephesians 5, 6. Number 9, tribulation wrath. It actually comes in two forms. On unbelieving Israel, Luke 21. Luke 21, 23. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against these people. Two, on the unbelieving world during the tribulation. Revelation 16, 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Three, eternal torment on the beast followers. That is those who follow the Antichrist. Revelation 14, 10 through 11. He too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which he has poured, poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image and for anyone who receives the mark of his name. That is a really sobering verse to think of it that the millions, perhaps billions, still on earth to experience the Antichrist who take the mark of the beast are going into torment forever. More eternal torment. Revelation 6, 16 and 17. This is when they start to get some of these uh, judgments on them. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Revelation eleven eighteen. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. What a grand day that will be. Revelation 19.15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. And this comes at the end of the tribulation. And then the final judgment. Acts 17.31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Romans 2, 5, But because of your stubborn and your unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Colossians 3, 6, our final verse, Because of these the wrath of God is coming. So we're discussing here the different types of wraths that come in relation to 
our verse, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. So, what wrath are we referring to when it says they are waiting to be rescued out of the coming wrath? Well, let's discuss this. There's actually not enough information in this verse alone. And in my view, not even the, the uh, entire chapter where we can see which wrath Paul is referring to. So when we have an issue come up like that, we're going to have to look for the answer elsewhere. But let me raise three possibilities. Is this the wrath of the second advent? that they're waiting to see. Is it what pre-tribbers would say, that those, those who believe in a pre-tribulation or rapture, is this the wrath of the tribulation? Another possibility, is it a reference to the final judgment that believers do not go through? Let me put those three possibilities up here on the board. Is the wrath of second advent? Is it the tribulation wrath? Is it a reference to the final judgment that believers uh, do not go through? That should be do not go through. Now we do know that it is coming. And we do know that Jesus rescues us from it. So we should broaden our search and begin with other passages to see if we can si find some better answers. Or should I just say an answer? We don't see anything in the first chapter of First Thessalonians. So we begin to read through the book. If we haven't read through it already, we should be looking for other hints that use similar phrases and perhaps even a similar way uh, to state it. Well, we get a good one in First Thessalonians 5.9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Now this is a point of Bible study, we might say. Yes, verse 9 does sound similar. Then verse 10 talks about He died for us, so that we are awake or sleep may live together with him. Now if we just take these two verses alone, we might say, well, this might just refer to the final judgment. But then we see this awake or asleep and say, well, well maybe there's something more here. Yes, there is. This actually goes back to the previous verses, and this is why you need to read the entire passage to see this relates to the second advent and the day of the Lord. Now, at this point in our study, and I'm saying this because we're kind of fluid here, as this, this best fits our interpretation it has to do with being delivered from the second advent wrath that comes upon the world. Now, why it's not tribulational wrath will become obvious as we progress through these epistles. I'm not going to take the time to explain that now. It's simply to say that um, that is such a major um, controversy. The difference between the pre-tribbers and the post-tribbers, you might say, that I want us to kind of walk through that, and we need to do it at length. Could it be a reference to final judgment? That's still possible. But in light of the fact that they're waiting for Jesus, and it says they're anticipating his coming, that they're rescued, it speaks of Jesus being raised from the dead, which may refer, have be a slight reference to the believer's resurrection, 
everything still points to it being a second advent reference. So at this point, and I might change because I'm still studying a huge amount of scripture on this, and I don't want to settle on it yet because I don't want to wait four months for a, an answer. <laughs> but at this point, I believe it's pointing to the coming wrath. I think I, uh, that is what it's, uh, the coming wrath that refers to the uh, second advent. But like I said, I'm not hard and fast on this at this point. I like to be that way when I'm teaching, but honestly, there's too much other ground to cover to be too dogmatic about it. But I will tell you this, it's not the tribulational wrath. It can't be. There's some verses you can just read through the epistles and discover that. Well, our verse one more time, 110, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, a few more things before we close. Waiting is a notable attitude, as Paul writes to so many in his letters. <clears throat> Let me use some of those verses, some we've looked at recently in James, if you're with me on that. Romans 8.23, Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. But by faith we eagerly wait through the Spirit, the righteousness for which we hope. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then James, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Let's, let's read through the entire chapter one more time, all ten verses. Verse 1, Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you making mention of you constantly in our prayers. Remembering your work of faith and labor of love and endurance of hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, loved of God, your election. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved among you for your sakes. You also became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us out of the coming wrath. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that we get when we know that even in those days when they were going through difficult times, they eagerly anticipated the return of Jesus. And so, Father, make this so real to us that as we face our own troubled times that we too will look forward to that hope, to that rescue, to that time of being with our Lord forever. We thank you for these things. We ask that the Spirit of God will challenge us with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.